Hi, this is Jason Watt. Welcome back to the CE Drive podcast. In this episode, I'll be chatting with uh, Russ Sawatsky. Russ is another in a line of uh, advice only financial planners that we've had on the show here um, and folks that I've met through the FPAC, the Financial Planning Association of Canada community. Uh, this episode will be good for life insurance credits in all jurisdictions, no accident and sickness credits in Alberta. Uh, it'll be good for a financial planning credit from FP Canada. It'd be good for a professional development credit from IROC. And it will be good for um, one investment strategies and asset allocation credit from MFDA. So still not exactly sure how the MFDA credits are working out, but we're getting episodes approved for them. Uh, so I'd be curious to hear what anybody's run into on that MFDA side. Okay, uh, Russ and I cover a whole range of stuff in here. Um, a lot of it focuses on working with people who either are or uh, are about to stop being uh, do-it-yourself investors. So you'll hear us talk about DIY a fair bit, that is do-it-yourself. Um, we cover a bunch of different topics. One of the things that I wanna mention here, something that comes up in the discussion that not everybody might be aware of, is a single ticket ETF. Uh, this is a relatively new um, innovation in Canada. These are basically asset allocation ETFs. Think like a balanced mutual fund, but in an ETF structure. So there are um, Vanguard. Vanguard has sort of, I think, three models of this. Uh, VBAL being the, the best known, that's a, an ETF that's 60% equity and 40% fixed income. Um, and sort of what you get there then is just, and this is the idea, this is why it's a single ticket ETF, is that you're supposed to be able to invest there and there only. And that's kind of your you know, broad um, asset diversification strategy. Um, most of the balanced ETFs or the single ticket ETFs have really um, well diversified holdings. So some Canada, some US, some global, uh, there's fixed income in there, obviously. Uh, the intention being, again, that you don't need anything else in a portfolio. And I think that they work reasonably well for um, investors who are um, really not needing that diversification beyond just the, let's say, plain vanilla kind of mix of equities in the basket, mix of fixed income in the basket. Um, they are cheap, um, although... But to be careful here, there can be some layering of fees. So it's not unusual that you would pay a fee to hold that ETF. So you pay a fee sort of for the balance structure um, or the um, that uh, yeah, balance structure. And then you're gonna potentially have the fee for the underlying ETFs as well. So they can come in sort of in the range of 30 to 50 basis points. Um, I have a good blog post from Dan Bordelotti on this. That's the Canadian couch potato. And it explains the sort of layering of fees and some of the tax implications as well of holding these. Uh, but it is, uh, you know, as with most ETFs or many ETFs, a fairly simple way to invest that really doesn't require the, uh, the investor to, to do anything and gives you that uh, very broad uh, passive or indexed allocation to the markets. Okay, the object for today, I pulled a book off my bookshelf here. Um, this is actually one of my early favorites. I read this in high school for the first time. It's a science fiction classic. I don't even know if you can see it there, but uh, Neuromancer by William Gibson. Um, he's a Canadian author and um, he's had a run of good science fiction books, many of which are on my shelf back here. Um, sort of a visionary in that sense, uh, often, credit along with another author by the name of Bruce Sterling with sort of being early visionaries around what the internet might look like. Um, although the vision in this book is probably more like, I think what Mark Zuckerberg has in mind for meta, um, where you're sort of immersed in that internet um, more than just sort of surfing around watching cat videos. Um, but anyways, it's an excellent read. It's still a good read today. Um, there's some I think dystopian elements that uh, ring a little bit true as far as what cities have turned into, or at least what very large cities have turned into. Um, so yeah, it's an excellent book if you've not read it. Again, uh, Neuromancer by William Gibson. Okay, uh, let's roll into 
the interview with Russ. We'll hear what Russ has to say. Hi, I'm here today with Russell Sawatsky. Russell is a uh, fee for service. I, actually, I don't know how you present it. fee for service, fee only, advice only. How do you hold it? Advice that? only is a term I like to use. Okay, yeah. I know everybody has their own sort of approach to that. So, um, an advice only financial planner based out of uh, London, Ontario. Correct. And you operate, I think, primarily your practice uh, sort of online, virtual type of thing, Russ. Would I have that right? That's correct, yes. Yeah, so lots of Zoom meetings or whatever. Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> which is which is which has turned out to be very uh, very much in line with what's going on these days. So you didn't have to uh, learn to use Zoom two years ago like a lot of advisors did. No. Yeah. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about your practice? Yeah. I, actually, I, I began just a matter of a few months before we had that lockdown in the fall of 2019. Um, I had left, um, uh, finished working, chose to finish working with a. Uh, one of the big banks, uh, their, their direct investing uh, services and uh, uh, started my advice only financial planning practice in the fall of 2019. And uh, <clears throat> uh, what else can I say? I, I you know advice only means I'm not licensed to sell anything. Um, so I, I mean, you know, I mean you, in your introduction, you pretty well laid it out there. I, I work with uh, clients uh, virtually uh, usually through Zoom or some equivalent uh, service, and they can be anywhere from. Well, I've, I've had conversations uh, from from BC to uh, rural parts of Ontario, so uh, and a couple points in between. So, and do you have a sort of ideal client? Is there one client uh, profile that you like to deal with? Um, I, I generally like to work with people who are employed individuals as opposed to self-employed or, or corporate small corporation owners, that type of thing. Uh, you know, so-called T4 in employees or income earners. Um, they tend to be, I, I seem to be attracting people who are in their uh, 30s, perhaps people just getting started out, planning to start a family or they just recently started a family and are trying to plan their future. And also retirees or near retirees who are uh, trying to plan that next phase in their future. So. I, I like to work with both. Um, I have children who are in that young, younger cohort, and I guess I'm not that far from the older, the older cohort. So I feel like I have a connection to both, both sides. Not that I wouldn't uh, work with somebody in between, but uh, often it's with the D DIY investor who comes to me. So that uh, do-it-yourself investor, that DIYer, um, is that? Do you think it's? Like, was that intentional because you have that background with direct investing? Did you say these are people who maybe they're strong on the investment side, but they're missing other stuff in their financial lives? Yeah, um, it, it's exactly that. I mean, I, I, I was working you know, since 2005. I've been working in that in the self-directed or DIY investment world. And I kept on seeing these portfolios that looked, well, some of them looked wonderful. Some of them looked horrible. And I thought, um, you know, they could use some basic and uh, basic investment advice and in how uh, in, a, in terms of broad scope, like asset allocation types of things and how that integrates into their larger financial lives. Uh, and I, I, um, that was the inspiration behind it, really. Yeah. When you were working on the uh, direct investing side, did you sometimes look at portfolios and just like you, you can't say anything, right? Um, well, I mean, you, you you can comment with without uh, without uh, what should I say bias on it, I suppose. Right. But you're right, you're right. I mean, it, it's uh, it, yeah, I've, I've seen you know from certain I guess you say certain seniors who would be all in GICs and uh, and they would tell me, well, they they would often tell me straight out, yes, I I just don't want any risk at all, like type of thing. And then on the other hand, there'd be people who would be uh, full on in Hot stocks, as the range was like in was it 2018 or so uh, that kind of, that that period. Yeah, uh, you know that was their diversified portfolio. They had half a dozen of pots, uh, cannabis stocks in their in their portfolio, and that was all I saw. And so, I mean, yes, I saw a few well diversified portfolios, uh, and even them, I, I thought, 
there's an opportunity for them to understand investing within a larger context, financial planning context, and that was the desire I had. So um, that led to the development of it. I'm curious, and I know, um, in fact, I think you just reviewed um, the, uh, sorry, Dan Bordelotti's book, I think, right? Right, um, right. And so just on that note, Dan is well known for the Canadian couch potato portfolio. When you were on the direct investing side, how many people did you see that actually had that kind of portfolio? Not many. Every once in a while, I would see one. I and mean, typically, uh, typically, it would be the TDs E series funds that I would see there, uh, and they and then they would have it divided, you know, in, into three or four equal lots, depending on whether or not they want bonds or. But they would, yeah, they would have it fairly well diversified according to, uh, you know, Dan's couch potato uh, recommendations. So. That might be a Rob Carrick influence too, eh? If they're using the TDE series, I know he wrote about uh, it a lot. I, I suppose so. Yes, he he, he does, doesn't he? Um, I, I, yeah, I think that Dan's book is really all about uh, ETFs now. But uh, uh, a few years ago, when I, I think uh, when the ETF world wasn't maybe quite so comprehensive, and you couldn't get those all in one asset allocation uh, ETFs. He would he would still recommend that as one of the options, I believe. But anyway, yeah. I don't I think you're right. Apologies, apologies for Dan Perlotti's <laughs> approach. <laughs> um, I'm actually curious then too about the single ticket ETFs. Do you do you think those are a good solution <clears throat> for a lot of your DIY clients? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I'm, I mean, I'm not. To, I, I I I will lay out a whole in a an appendix of my plan, I usually lay out a whole wide range of investment options and, and include those, some of those as examples uh, from Vanguard or iShares and BMO, and then some of their ESG options too that they have, that iShares in particular has available, that type of thing. Um, plus I, yeah, just some of those basic building blocks, the type that you would see in Dan Portloy's portfolio, or they like, uh, recommendations, you know, Canadian, US, international, emerging, and then fixed income. So, and then build a, recommend an asset allocation based on their particular circumstances, but then give them that wide range to choose from. So how do you manage? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. There's lots out there, right? Right. Um, how do you manage your, like you said, you sort of say, here's like a sample portfolio, right? right. So. Right. How do you manage the the delivery of investment advice versus the you know the lack of investment licensing? What's your thought process there? Yeah, um, well, I, 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 as I understand it, we uh, without a license, you're you're allowed to comment on an existing portfolio, say what it's likely to do based on. I use FP Canada's guidelines in terms of invest expected investment returns, uh, maybe tweaking it with based on the MERs of the existing assets that they, uh, that they might have. Um, and uh, then I, I have my, uh, you know, an ideal asset allocation that I would suggest they should be in. And wherever there's a gap, I say, here's a way of dealing with it. Uh, you know, and, and uh, I don't recommend anything specifically. I just say, these are the wide varieties of things you can do here and uh, point them in direct, you know, I, I link them to websites where they can see those various uh, options uh, and how they can build them from there. I, I've uh, reviewed this with others who are in the advice only world and there's not a large group of us and everybody seems to be, I think, reasonably confident that they're, that they're staying on the right side of regulations as far as that goes. So that's the approach I take. Uh, I've read the regulations and I tend to agree with that approach. I think that sort of like as long as you're not saying buy apple right it's it's kind right. of it's okay right it's um yeah but yeah it is there is some gray area i know i've heard and i think you and i participated in an online discussion about this where you know the rules kind of say one thing and there was somebody who commented that osc osc staff has said something maybe a little more mm -hmm. aggressive and i i wonder about that you know if it's uh, like a verbal comment from staff that i don't know how much weight that carries so I don't know either, but uh, yeah. um, I mean, there, there's at least one one organization I think they, who do advice only services. I'll 
I'm not mentioning their name right now, and they were reviewed or audited. And as far as I, I am aware, they came through without any issues. So, yeah, that's good. And I think I have another conversation upcoming about this with somebody who's uh, more purely on the, uh, let's say, investment advice side at a fee only firm. So maybe we'll go okay. this a little bit more there. So oh, that'll, be, that'll be a good follow on. Yeah. Um, now, going back to the, the DIY investor, you talked about ESG here. You, it sounds like you actually end up talking about ESG a little bit in your plans. I, I do periodically. Some people mention it specifically. Um, and so I'll, I'll um, you know, I may have to work hard to even find a, a wide variety of things. And um, but for the most part, I just include it as a, as I say, as like a, just a regular, it's not a recommendation. This is just one thing. If you are interested in this, here's a, here are some ETFs or ETF portfolio ETFs that uh, will do the job for you. Um, I'm actually working with a, a, a bit, I've worked with a client who, um, they, you know, has a particular notion of what is ethical. And um, and so it's it doesn't really fit into the these ready-made ESG portfolio ETFs. So um, I was I've been spending a little bit of time just sort of what you know co compiling a long list of of uh, you know very kind of narrow niche type ESG ETFs and uh, suggesting that. If we can try and you know, I'll, I'll give them their asset allocation and suggest you should might want to pick from around these and see if you can meet a, a reasonable asset allocation without uh, without venturing outside of your criteria. So uh, that's a it's a bit of a challenge, I think. But uh, I, I I I think every I learn everything from something new from every plan, and this is one of those opportunities to dig into it. So. Yeah, it's it is interesting because yeah, the the ethical screens people might want to develop don't necessarily yeah ESG is common but what if you have a, a halal investor or somebody who you know has and the very first actually research paper I ever read for whatever reason on this issue was a biblical portfolio it was like there was a bunch of stuff that was specifically forbidden for that reason so yeah it's uh, right. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you're. Well, we don't necessarily have to get into this, but the, I, I come from a Mennonite church background, and the Mennonites were fairly heavily involved in some of the earlier socially responsible investing yes. uh, fund, mutual fund developments. Uh, you know, 15, 20 years ago. So it's it's an area of it's been of interest to me. Yeah, I think actually maybe two or three episodes ago, David O'Leary had somebody on his podcast talking about that the impact. Oh, is that right? Podcast, okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, de definitely somebody with a strong Mennonite connection, and there was a there was very much that discussion about the Mennonite Church's connection to impact, sort of early institutional impact investing. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, now, what do you see? Where do you see the sort of distinction between do-it-yourself investing, which I think gets a lot of attention, and then do-it-yourself financial planning? Do you have like, would you say some of your clients have done DIY financial planning, or have they just sort of ignored financial planning? Um, I think so, some of them, yes, do uh, have at least some components of financial planning in their in their DIY uh, uh, processes. I guess you could say, like uh, some people are fairly. I think the most common thing is that they're they're fairly. Um, uh, nailed down in terms of their budgets and how they spend money. So the financial management aspect is often quite well done. Uh, the couple, a couple of couple of the clients I've met, they've they've been inspired by Dave Ramsey, I believe. Who I mean, he has his own bigger um, notion of what uh, you know how one should manage one's finances, but not that I necessarily have ascribed to it or subscribed to it entirely. But uh, they. they I, I haven't really read much about Ramsey, but I, I think I need to give him I see that attract a few clients who have who are acolytes of, of his, um, which is not to say it's it's bad. It's, it's very I think it's very good in helping people who aren't in control of their finances to find a, a path forward. So those those types of people, others, yeah, they usually they come. It's amazing. Sometimes they come to me with a, you know a spreadsheet that has their all their expenditures and they know what they spend on a given month and that type of thing. Uh, I often and I think less so in the, let's say the estate planning side of things. Might, some people say, well, I have a will or I don't have a will at all. I'm not sure why I should have a will. Uh, they haven't really thought 
maybe they've uh, done the insurance and risk management thing a little bit, which means they bought a life insurance policy through a sales representative who, is, who may or may not have been more concerned about a, a commission uh, than uh, what was best for them at that time of their life type of thing. Um, I, I, having never been in the, invest, in the insurance world, I feel a little less uh, adequate to discuss that in great detail with them. Um, uh, so it, it, the one area where I've made a referral has been in the insurance area. So uh, when somebody was asking about guidance on that area in particular. Would you sort of, as part of the insurance side, would you do like needs analysis and say, and then, you know, it's kind of up to you to go and fill that gap? That right, right. I feel pretty comfortable about doing the needs analysis, bringing the numbers together. What well, you know, a, a scenario where they were to, where one spouse was to, you know, if it's a married couple, one spouse was to die tomorrow, or that, I mean, that kind of, uh, you know, I, I, I'm hope, hope, definitely not hoped for a scenario, but how it might work, and then recommend, you know, recommend a, or review what what they have in terms of insurance, whether it's through their employer or privately purchased insurance, and then see, well, here's a gap, or you're actually in a good good place, that type of thing. So. I'm curious then, do you end up talking about like disability insurance and critical illness insurance to a significant extent or is that? Uh, like... yeah. yeah, go ahead, sorry, yeah. No, that's fine. Um, disability insurance, I think I've brought up a lot more than critical illness insurance. The disability insurance, um, sometimes I think people, I mean, people are, or the general public, I suppose you could say, is really zeroed in on life insurance. Or, but the reality is, as I think you're, you're well aware, more people are likely to be disabled for a period of time than they are to die. And so disability insurance is not well attended to um, and as a risk management strategy. So I do bring it up. I do provide a, a needs analysis and, uh, and uh, make some recommendations in that area. Again, I, I'd have to refer outward t toward uh, someone who could, you know, a spe specialized insurance agent who could handle that. But you uh, do you find yourself reading benefits booklets in? Like, is that part of your normal information gathering? It is, or it can be. It's not always the case. I, I've had a few retirees who are no longer yeah. in in that realm, but yes. Yeah, certainly for your thirty-year-olds, you said that that has to be a, and you said mostly T four employees, right? So right. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, now, what else do you see as, as gaps? You said estate planning specifically here. You said financial management sometimes is well done. You said estate planning is a gap, risk management maybe. Anything right. else you see people not doing particularly well when they're DIYing it? Oh, um, I guess I'm, I mean, maybe I've talk, touched on that a, a little bit already, but I see the DIYer. I mean, it's usually they come to me with, it's just been investing has really been their thing, right? And so um, that's been the, the main gap. Um, other things, tax planning, I mean, just people may not be aware of some of the things they can do. For example, um, I mean, I, I've, I've found I'm, I'm writing a fairly significant paragraph about people who are, uh, who, do, who do donations, so charitable donations, and they, if they're doing relatively small amounts, I, mean, I know you, I remember you actually teaching this in the class that we, we, you, you led, um, but it's, it's something I've been aware of myself. That just simply, if you, you know, you, you could uh, really improve things if you just donate more than $200 in a given year, or if you carry over the donation from last year to, a, to the following year, and, or you know, I guess it's a five year range, I believe, you can, you can carry forward donations. So you can really make a, a big bang of a difference in your taxes if you just go ahead and accumulate those so that they get above that, get into that 29% uh, uh, range. Yeah, that's that's a good point. And yeah, that's it's funny that it does overlap exactly with one of my more um, controversial exam questions, I think. So, <laughs> um, so what about uh, when it comes time to the estate plan, do you find people, because now there are DIY options available to write your will and power of attorney right. and so forth. Do you yeah. find like, are people happy to go to a willful or do they go to a lawyer and get full service will done? Um, you know, that's one of the one areas where I haven't really heard people. I mean, I, I make fairly strong recommendations. I have a, 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 a list of action steps that I provided for the end of the plan. 
and I usually talk if there's a, a will missing or it's sadly out of you know very out of date or that type of thing then I usually put that as a high priority but I haven't heard much in the way of feedback in terms of people acting on it um, maybe I'm just trying to think about recent clients you know, they, they, you know, they don't have uh, a couple of don't have children. They feel like either way, they're, they're both earning enough money that they can handle it themselves. So they feel like, wow, it's no big deal. I mean, I try to emphasize that there are still issues there where it makes life a lot simpler if you have a, even a simple will drawn up. Um, but uh, I haven't really gotten much feedback on that from my clients so far. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be an interesting one. I, I'd like to see whether the, you know, whether there's a correlation between DIY investing and DIY wills, right? That's, a, mm -hmm. yeah, I wonder. Um, and what do you think causes people? Do you, do you have sort of common characteristics where you say, this is what I expect to see in a DIY investor? What, what motivates people to go down that path? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, a few different uh, uh, paths that that seem to that seem to lead to that. Um, some people were with a full service advisor, decided they could do better themselves. Um, maybe they've done some reading. Maybe they've read Dan Bordelotti's books or his Couch yeah. Potato website and uh, figured. And then they compared uh, with what they see in their own portfolio and they uh, they choose that route. Others um, don't have a lot of money, can't attract a financial advisor other than through a big bank. And maybe they, for whatever reason, they may not want to go there. Um, and so that's another option. I think a third option, and this is speaking more to my experience of observation of uh, people when I was in the direct investing world, they view the they view investing as kind of like the lottery. And uh, you know, I, my goal is to buy that penny stocks that's gonna, that's gonna turn into the next Amazon type of thing. And, and, and so they, you know, I mean, I haven't heard that specifically, but that seems to be the attitude. Um, so those are, and those approaches obviously aren't going to be uh, looked after or supported by an investment advisor who's who's more concerned about one hopes about uh, a proper diversified diversified uh, uh, asset allocation. So yeah, it's when I was a young officer in the military, that was a very common thing. You know, these uh, like young officers with good income. And they would go set up these DIY portfolios and you know, load it up with junior oil and gas. That was a big one, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. I've but, seen uh, all those. Yeah, yeah. Some junior tech companies too in there sometimes. But yeah. Right. That's, uh, yeah, I, I guess. I don't know. Um, <laughs> now, do you have thoughts about, and I know this is not really your role, but if, if, if I were a full service advisor, so let's say, you know, I'm doing a traditional, a commission and, and sort of fee-based uh, full service financial advisory capacity. And I have somebody comes to me who's traditionally been a DIY mm -hmm. investor. Would you have advice for that person about what they can do to make that transition work? So for the advisor? For the if advisor, it, yeah. If, it's a, if a former or up until then DIY investor came to them? Yes. Um, I mean, I, 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 would, I would tend to think uh, there might be a couple of reasons why that transition might be might be desired by someone who's been a DIY investor until then. One reason would be simply that they're 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 getting older and they feel like they're no longer able to manage it uh, active as actively as they have been themselves. And and uh, I guess the second one would be if the I mean along with being coming becoming older, perhaps there's some complexities at it. There might be if there if there are certain uh, degrees of wealth, they might have want to open trusts and uh, they may have uh, um, a variety of, uh, of um, assets that are generating income and in retirement from various sources and they just feel like it's, it's getting to be too much. I guess the first thing I would say to that advisor is, uh, um, is don't, don't disrespect the work they've done. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't know what that's the you know, a lot of most, most but not not all advisors are are use actively active strategies. I suppose you could say. So, um, if someone's used a a um, passive or index investing type strategy in the DIY world, um, 
and then I, you know, I, I, I well, I'm not sure what, what I would recommend to them, but I mean, I think you have to respect the fact that they managed to take themselves that far uh, would be one element of things. I would also say that they should probably try and do a full financial plan for them to, to uh, understand their overall context, but uh, uh, I'm not sure that's a really helpful answer, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, and I asked the question because I hear this from time to time, right? You hear from advisors who, you know, for whatever reason, you, you mentioned a couple here, the, you've got that client who feels like they, they have to make that transition, but I think those are often unsuccessful. I think a lot of times the, the relationship sours fairly quickly or you know, they don't even get to the point of a, a full financial plan and the client kind of says, well, whatever, I was doing fine before, I'll go back and do fine again. Yeah, uh, I mean, in the DIY world, uh, direct investing world, I've, had, I've seen people who are customers of that uh, service who've moved from full service to robo-advisor and back again, and they're just in and out. And there's a, a real history of it. And I, I don't understand, I suppose, uh, uh, what's going on there other than they felt like, oh, I think I can do better myself, or I don't like the restrictions that were imposed upon my portfolio or that type of thing. So, but, you know, I mean, I, I'm, uh, I've had, I have a client who has said routinely, it says eventually we're going to get to the, and they're DIYing it themselves. And eventually we're going to get to the point where we're going to go, go back, put our assets back in our local credit union and have them, you know, have the advisor there manage it. And they'll be, they'll be satisfied. They say they'll be satisfied with that. To have someone at least giving some regular oversight over it. Now, I don't, um, I, it may be a, I mean, not just their, their frontline uh, advisor, but, or, but probably someone who's a little more uh, savvy than that within the credit union complex of services they provide. So, yeah, that is interesting because you wonder if that's the case, why aren't they doing that right now? Is that like, is it they want a extra control over their situation or they have, is it a hobby for them? Do you, do you have a sense of why that is? Um, I think, I mean, I'm just thinking about that particular client couple, and I think there's just a, you know, over time, they've become more and more confident in their understanding of what investing is. And so they shifted from maybe having most of their uh, their assets in, in, in the GICs or, or the uh, mutual funds from that financial institution. And then they, and they decided, you know, we can, we can probably do a bit better, maybe focus our investments in a certain area that uh, is not provided there and then, uh, and, and test that out. And then maybe as a, as a backstop or <laughs> they, they go to a, a uh, advice only financial planner to, uh, to help uh, support the, the overall view of their finances. So at least that's the way I would interpret a particular client couple I'm working with, yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Now, um, in your practice then, um, at least reading through your process and your website, you make a distinction here between creating the plan. You say my first step or the, the first big thing we're gonna do together is create the financial plan. And then we're going to have a coaching engagement to implement the plan. Am I making that distinction properly? Yes, I, yeah, I, mean, I, I do say that. And um, although I suppose one could say that, I mean, the, the implementation, that coaching period, certainly is part of the overall financial planning engagement. Um, I think the, if there's a challenge there, it, it's that uh, I, you know, once the plan is presented, I want, I want to engage with them um, and, and help with the impl implementation. Uh, but, you know, they have, they have to be prepared or, uh, or willing or responsive to the invitation that I offer them to, to meet to discuss things. And, and they're, it's not always the case. Some feel, I mean, I don't know, maybe I've disappointed them. They don't want to come back to me for anything more. <laughs> you know, not every, not every client I've dealt with has, has, uh, has taken me up on that. Or maybe they've just felt maybe DIYers that they are, they feel I can take care of this myself type of thing. So um, I, 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 I offer and suggest that we have a regular, like an annual checkup just to see where they're, how they're going. But um, uh, so I do want to engage with them through, you know, on an ongoing basis, but uh, not everyone chooses to do that. So 
best I can say about that. Um, I'm not sure if I really quite respond to your question there. The, the this, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call coaching and I mean, creating a plan is a is a step I take. The coaching or implementation is a is a second step, but both of them are part of the financial plan, I guess you could say. So I mean, when you're writing the like right from minute one of writing the financial plan, you're I assume right. you're thinking about implementation. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Um, it's, it's addressing the purposes they have for their their money or their financial uh, paths that they take. Right. Do you find people so the and I don't know if there's two different answers to this, depending, like you said, some people take you up on that and some don't. Mm -hmm. Do you think people are motivated to actually take those steps? Or do you think that they have entered into this and then they re they see it and they, oh my goodness, like it's a daunting exercise. It's it's too mm -hmm. much. Or, you know, they had the best intentions, but it's never going to get executed. What's your feeling about where people fall on that spectrum? Yeah, I, I mean, I boil it, I boil it down to, um, I think, fairly succinct steps that they're to take in, in, in their action steps, like uh, as I use that, describe that section. So it's, but the, you know, it, it still means action on their part, you know, um, and so some people will do uh, some, of, some of it, uh, you know, like the adjusting their, their investing, for example, is one is where I seem to get a, a lot of feedback that yeah this is what, where I wanted to go. Uh, others felt it more uh, others are coming across more as a as a verification like a, 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 a near retired couple said okay we're on track good these are a few things we need to do and uh, we'll get on them and, and you know I said look you know then and, and I just touch base with them periodically say look are you looking for any help all, along the way and, and they say yeah yeah we will we'll do that. Um, I'm not sure whether they've done it. I, I need to get in touch with some of those folks again. So, but I, I do try and keep on keep uh, that available. But it, it's a little bit different somehow. You know, the plan the pick somehow puts a, a a period on on the fit written plan somehow puts a period on it, and then the implementation support that I'm offering just somehow seems to be uh, not always, but sometimes a something they feel they can do themselves. Um, oddly enough, I mean, I'm giving them up to five extra hours of my time that I'm going to do. So uh, I shouldn't say extra hours, five hours included with the service I provide, but they not always done, uh, used, at least not yet. So you said you do a uh, fairly succinct, like step-by-step. -step. So, you know, write a will is not just write a will. You would break that down into its sort of subject components. Is that, do you, I don't know um, who your influences are on this. Do you, like, do you, do, do you know Amara Summer's book, uh, Advice That Sticks? Is this kind of the, a thing I've read it. Um, I'm not sure I've fully integrated it into my behavior yet myself, but uh, yes, I, I mean, I, uh, I do say these are things to do in, in, in the body of the in the body of the uh, plan. I, I give more details as to how they should go about do, doing it and, and why it should be done, the rationale and that sort of thing. So, uh, um, um, but maybe maybe there is a maybe there's something from. Uh, where summers I work, I could I could uh, think about more and try and help with that. That's a it's a good quite good uh, thought on that part. Um, Maybe I don't know. I, I, yeah, no, I mean there are certainly people who are are running with it and they're taking up the up on my time, and and conversation can be email or it can be uh, it can be you know Zoom or phone calls that type of thing. And I certainly get a lot of that um, along the way, but. Um, there's some people who I don't hear from a lot uh, too. So, anyway. and what about the one-page financial plan then? Maybe the like, do you do you ever think about things in context of the one-page financial plan? Yeah, I mean, I, I've heard of that idea. I'm not sure I'm really doing it. <laughs> I mean, the the uh, the um, the action steps are really you know are about a page long, and so there's that. Um, I, 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 I'm not super familiar with uh, how to take that into my thing, but my plans tend to be tend to have a lot of uh, background to them, I guess you could say. So yeah. all of the actual recommendations are are fairly fairly succinct, I guess I would say. Yeah, you strike me. I mean, I know you're very technically proficient, 
and you strike me as fairly analytical. I'm sure it's hard to rein yourself in sometimes when you're writing those plans. <laughs> so. right. um, yeah, and I don't know if you want to. I mean, that's the. I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm sure. Some, I'm sure some clients find that attractive, right? Where they say, yeah. like, I know that when Russ makes a recommendation for me, it's it's well founded, right? Yeah. yeah. I like. I like to think so. Um, yeah. yeah I, I prefer to not just be talking out of my hat. Right. <laughs> Um, now, uh, if we can switch gears a little bit here, sure. The so you have a, a a pretty strong blog, like you you have blog posts that are full on, you know, technical articles with you know background information, footnotes in there, right? This is you you really take I think the blog seriously. I think I've got that. That's a fair comment. Yeah, it's uh, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, um, I would put in. Uh, lots of hours into it each week. So, do you see it as is it part of your job? Like, is this some is it a labor of love? Is it something you you have to do? Like, this is how you bring value to your clients. Where do you strike that balance, or or do you even think about why you're doing it? <laughs> um, I suppose it initially started as just, I guess the term it uses content marketing, right? You know, instead of trying to, uh, well, I, I didn't didn't really budget much for a marketing or sales campaign ever in the course so far. Uh, but uh, um, putting out uh, blog posts uh, that are then reposted to various other social media sites um, that I have access to is uh, was originally intended as a way of bringing in clientele, getting my name out there and that type of thing. But I, I it also, um, I think as you put it, it scratches the creative itch in my part. I, I, I like to think that I, I'm pretty good as a writer. I, I, and um, actually, I, I have a neighbor who, who writes novels, and I, I proofread for him. So that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're they're not anything to do with finance. So it also takes my mind into another space. So yeah. And um, yeah, so I think it, 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 it's attracting new clients. It, it uh, is something that I enjoy doing. Um, I now have a, a vehicle by which to present it, and it's uh, it also helps me communicate with, uh, you know, to put something out there for my for my current clients or clients who I've worked with in the past to um, give them something to work with. Sometimes it's uh, you know the client uh, the client has uh, an issue with a client that comes up, and I the blog post is inspired by that particular thing that I didn't really know enough tell I didn't know enough about, it. so I start handing it down and. I find myself going to the Canada.ca website to find information about, uh, you know, RDSPs or or um, Liras and things like that uh, fairly often. And so I try to find, you know, sources that are legitimate. Uh, and the Advisor.ca website, I believe, is that the uh, that, that that Advisors Edge, I think, is called. That, that yeah. Uh, so they, yeah, they have Advisor.ca, and that's yeah. where Advisors yeah. Edge lives as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I use that report, I think, actually. So, yeah. 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 And I, I guess I'll add as well I, I, I've used my course material as a, as a, as a launching point, uh, including from, from your uh, your class, um, CF, CFP classroom materials. So, uh, that's always a, a good source to start from, too. So, uh, yeah. okay. That, that makes sense. And then with the sort of so you talked about content marketing here. I know I see you on on Twitter. Um, do you have? I don't know where else you're at, like Instagram or Reddit. Do you have a sense for what actually people read that that brings you clients? Um, I, you know, that's a good question. I'm not 100 percent sure. Most of the time, people when I ask people uh, clients or potential clients, they say, "Well, I I search for advice only or fee only planner and." And your name came up, and you know, I don't know what other filters they 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 popped in. Maybe they said London, Ontario, or something. If they're from London, although as I say, I've had people in Alberta, I've had people in rural Ontario, so um, and contacts from Winnipeg and elsewhere. So uh, uh, I, I, it seems like it's. I think that that regular feeding of information in there and. Describing myself always as an advice-only planner probably 
just makes my profile rise a little bit. I'm really not that much of a Google Analytics kind of person, uh, but uh, so I but I do post on, as you say, on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, Instagram, um, as what you know from from my blog yep. on my website. Again, yeah. that makes a lot of sense. And how much of this, like, do you do your existing clients read all your stuff? Do you do you have a sense for that? Um. Not, I, I don't get a lot of feedback from them about it. Every once in a while, I do, uh, or they, or before they become my clients, they've said, they've already said, "I've read a lot of your blog posts, and I really like the way you write." Okay. So I guess yep. if they didn't like the way I, they, that I wrote, <laughs> I guess they wouldn't be talking to me. But <laughs> yes, that's true. Yeah. Um, now, there's like your stuff is really good. I find there is a lot of great stuff on the web. I see you know, more and more good stuff showing up on YouTube now. Um, even Reddit gets some good stuff on it. Um, and then also there's lots of stuff that is, uh, you know, dangerous or offside or just, you know, misinformed. I assume you would see a lot of clients who show up having done, you know, having watched YouTube videos or listened to podcasts or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. What do you say when somebody has gotten some bad advice when they've read something that that's just flat out wrong or they, you know, they've taken action based on something they've read that doesn't apply to their circumstances? How do you deal with those circumstances? I'm just trying to think if I talked to any clients who've come to me with really crazy ideas, <laughs> if, I can, if I can use that term, I, I don't know that I have. I mean, I, I think it's been more people who don't know what they, who don't know what they don't know, if I can put it that way. And then, so they come to me uh, with a sense of ignorance, I, I shouldn't say, you know, but, but, um, uh, acknowledging their, their lack of understanding on these matters. There's a few people who've said, that, you know, um, who might have good pieces, but they don't have the pieces fitting in as a, co- uh, as a co- cohesive, uh, um, full orb, uh, plan, I guess you could say. So they yeah, might I, know about this, might know about that, but they don't see how it puts, fits together. So that's I, been my more common experience. I definitely see that on my my YouTube channel because I get, you know, I have a bunch of like videos about how like OAS works, right? And I think mm-hmm. I just had one last week maybe where somebody commented on OAS and like I'm not a financial advisor and I'm not going to be delivering financial advice on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know that person asks a question, and you can see that there's so much more there, but you can't like it, yeah. those are hard. I find, and it's exactly what you said though. That person didn't really have an overall grasp; they were really focused on one one narrow right. set of details. So I, I've also joined a couple of Facebook groups that talk about retirement or or um, finance, and every once in a while I'll, I'll see something that just seems egregiously wrong and and just say look that's not not correct you know it's it's pure factual stuff so um i i i don't hesitate to let, let if i see it early enough before 10 million other people have corrected it <laughs> right, right. I, i'm i'm willing to uh you know go in there and just say like this is this is actually not correct and right so you, you might not disagree about the best age to start cpp but you could disagree about when somebody actually has to riff Right, like that right, kind of thing. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Fair. Um, now, what else do you do? You talked about using Canada.ca. Um, you talked about going back to textbook reference and so forth. Um, what else do you do? Is there any other sort of, let's say, focused method in your business for staying current? Um, well, just, uh, you just know, to, like read as much as you can. Is, is yeah, that I think that's uh, and that's it. I mean, if you, if you don't like to read, I don't know how one can be a how you can be a financial planner, uh, <laughs> or you know, you just need to be on top of stuff. And 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 I mean, and reading can I guess go beyond just reading. I I listen to podcasts. Uh, uh, you know, this yours is one. Although I haven't used your you for a CE. For a, the credit you part, yet, you don't but, need uh, them yet. You're okay because you <laughs> got certified, or you got your CFP certification. Well, not yet. Actually, passed the exam in 2020, right? Right, right. So, yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, but uh, rational reminder is a good one on investing. I think um, in the U.S., uh, Michael Kitsis and Carl Richards do their thing. Yeah. Uh, so, podcasts. I go for a walk and I listen. 
you know, listen for 45 minutes or so, and then I'm, uh, you know, I'm up to date on some, if they're not necessarily uh, directly applicable to legal or, 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 you know, regulatory matters or whatever, or that, or how one has to do it, they, they, they do have an approach to uh, providing advice and, and uh, thinking about issues like a uh, reason I heard on inflation, which is sort of in everybody's world these days. So, uh, yeah, uh, between podcasts and reading um, physical books or ebooks and uh, reading uh, online sources that I discern as use useful, uh, that covers a lot. And plus, there's the Financial Planning Association of Canada Forum, which is just a wealth of information. Uh, you know, uh, I, I'm so glad to be part of it, frankly. It's really very helpful. So, absolutely agreed. Yeah, that's been a, a great learning resource for me as well. And uh, mm -hmm. I really I, I like it because um, I get there's a lot of like there's a good mix of questions on there. There's the very technical stuff, but there's also a ton of practice management stuff on there. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now you did you mentioned uh, sort of where you're at with your study. So you, I think November 2020 you passed your CFP exam. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So congratulations on that. That's I know that's a while ago now, but that's a yeah. big accomplishment. Yeah. Um, and thanks, so, thanks to your help for sure. <laughs> it's, it's nice of you to say. I think that you would have been fine on your own, but I always like having you know. It's uh, it's, it's always nice to hear people say that still. Um, so when you're going through the program, I I think you were pretty tech, and I mean you even asked some fairly technical questions while you're going through the program. I recall. Um, and corrected some stuff in the textbook, which I, again, always grateful for. What did you learn going through the program that was, let's say, completely new to you, even with your fairly strong technical background? Was there, was there stuff there where you said, oh, I, like, I just never really thought about this, or here's something I can actually take away and use with clients? Or was it more like filling little gaps in knowledge? Well, I, I mean, I think it was probably a pretty big gap, but I didn't really have much background in in um, biz the business world, like you know, financial planning for business owners, uh, small corporations, um, you know, even even depreciating assets and things like that. It's something I remember studying years ago when I took an accounting course. I mean, we're talking, I'm, I'm you know, we're talking decades ago. So, <laughs> uh, so those sorts of things are were really valuable for me to know. It also uh, made me realize that there are limitations to what I feel like I can properly provide to someone right now. And that's why I say I'm more inclined towards a, someone who's an employed person versus a business owner uh, as, a, as a client, because I don't feel yet like I would be very uh, at, sufficiently competent to advise them on some of the, uh, I wouldn't say tricks, but some of the, you know, the, the, the more... Uh, Arcane, I guess you could say, uh, rules of the of the of the, of the tax code that uh, uh, apply to businesses. So yeah, I mean, there yeah, there is some really, and it, arcane's a good word, but it it's so very specialized, right? Yeah. And 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 hard to see sometimes where where there's opportunities or you know where you're missing something, mm -hmm. and and the scenario like the just the initial scenarios are so complicated and often you're adding layers of complexity to make something work. So yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's fair. And I guess that's, that's probably a value to your clients, right? Like when you're working with, if you say my, my focus is on, you know, T4 employees, well, you're, you're that much further ahead with every client that way. Right. Like, they, yeah. 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 Um, sure. Now, what did you see missing from the program? What do you think should be taught? That's not. Oh boy! Um, you know, I didn't have much time to think about this. I'm sorry. I, I don't. I'm not sure if I have a, a real answer for you. I mean, I, I thought it was comprehensive. It certainly filled in. Uh, I'd done the Canadian Securities Institute coursework leading up to uh, the well, it was then the FPSC Level One Financial Planning Standards Council. Or, uh, yep. I can't remember called it, Level yep. One uh, right. exam. Yep. Now, now called the QAFP exam. Uh, I'd use those those materials, and then I just found that yours filled in. It reinforced a lot that I learned, and then filled in uh, details that I didn't really know about. Like I said, you know, the business was probably the biggest and most prominent area that I, the business uh, owners um, they were sort of not really addressed very in very much detail at all through the CSI materials. 
So I'm not sure about that gap. And uh, you know, CSI is probably good, really good on the investing side of things. I don't know if you want, if you ever would want to put more in, into that area, but I'm not sure it's really necessary. It's certainly not for me as an advice only planner. But uh, on the other hand, I also have a decade plus of experience working in the direct investing world, where knowing that is has been important. So yeah, I. I would like to add, and I'm working on this actually to to put more. Um, you talked about ESG already. I'd like to have more in that sort of impact investing space in the textbook. Um, and I uh, actually, Jason Pereira, our mutual friend, um, has a really good write up he's done on sort of risk tolerance, risk composure, and so forth. And mm -hmm. and it that got me thinking about how I could present that better in in my own material. So mm -hmm. there's always something, and it, it's like every week I come across something where I say, oh, I got to go back and tweak something in the textbook. It's... Yeah, well, you mentioned risk tolerance. I think that's a great subject to, and I, I'll say I still feel weak on. I mean, I try to use resources that I, that I can find, um, but you know, some of the conventional stuff is just, I don't know if it has much use, uh, but you know, going to, uh, the University of Missouri has a, has a a quite, uh, has a risk tolerance questionnaire that's based on, and then I can't think of the name of the of that. Those you know, a couple of guys who wrote things back in the back in the seventies or something like that, or not was it the nineties? Um, shoot, I can't even think of the name. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, but uh, I'll find it for the show notes, anyways. So okay. if you think of it, email it to me. Yeah. Uh, let's so. see. Yeah, I don't, I don't know off the top of my head, but yeah, that's fine. We'll get her. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, any uh, final thoughts or comments for us, Russ? You've been great. You've shared a lot of just a breadth of stuff and I've really enjoyed that. Um, um, well, you know, uh, just interesting thing is every once in a while I get a, I get some uh, contact from someone um, who's interested in becoming an advice only financial planner. And so um, had a chat with someone just recently, actually, and so, you know, I think it's it's an interesting area to be involved in. It's certainly you're not most likely not going to be. Uh, I mean, it, it seems like it's a, a good place for a solo effort. But on the other hand, if you're trying to get started in in, in anything in the financial world, and um, it's a little bit, it can be a bit daunting, especially if you need to have income coming in right away. Uh, I think this year is the first year, well, 2021 was the first year I actually made a profit. So <laughs> um, it, it just takes uh, takes some time. But uh, in any case, it's also, it's a very distinctive world, I think. And uh, I, I I like doing what I'm doing. And uh, yeah, yeah I just, perfect. just make that make that little endorsement about advice only planning as a, as a good, a good uh, niche to be in. Yeah, so. yeah. And it, there's not, Although it's getting bigger, but there's not that much advice only planning happening today in Canada. So yeah, I agree. Nice, uh, nice niche for somebody who's looking to find a home. And there is you, and I think you've gone over some of the reasons here why why it works for for you anyway. So that's really mm -hmm. good. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Russ. Enjoy the rest of your day, and uh, really you. appreciate your uh, your time and your wisdom here. Oh, it's my pleasure. It's always good to talk with you, Jason. I mean. You're the real source of wisdom here, I think. <laughs> but <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to, to, to chat with you. Thanks. Okay, um, lots there. Um, and one of the things that we touched on, it just ever so briefly touched on it, was the concept of halal investing. And this is where I want to give props. Actually, this is another FPAC relationship um, to uh, my friend Jason Pereira. Um, Jason has a podcast that uh, I find we often kind of overlap. We've had some of the same guests on and so forth. Um, but uh, Jason's pod, he has two podcasts, actually. And I've talked about one of them on this uh, show before, uh, Fintech Impact being one of his podcasts. It's excellent. Um, it's not all directly relevant for financial advisors. It's really, uh, it was just designed for anybody who sort of has an interest in the fintech uh, space. Uh, certainly lots there that's great for advisors. Um, but his one that is more, um, I think every episode is a must listen for an advisor, and that is uh, financial planning for Canadian business owners. 
And uh, with that podcast, uh, he just, it's kind of funny because Russ and I had this discussion and I mentioned the concept of halal investing. And uh, maybe the next day, uh, Jason dropped an episode that had an interview with the head of a Canadian um, halal bank. So that's a good listen. I'll put the uh, links in the show notes. Um, I quite enjoyed it and I learned a lot. Um, really interesting. I have a family, my sort of extended family. My wife's first husband was Lebanese um, and uh, they're all um, practicing the, the sort of extended families, I guess, mostly, I shouldn't say all, but the extended family um, with whom I still have uh, good connections. Um, that's all, it's my kids, cousins and so forth. So we've maintained strong connections there. Um, and they are all observant. So, and of course, Edmonton has a strong um, Muslim community. So this idea of um, halal investing, it's something that I'm going to be digging into a little bit more. And I think it's an idea for a future episode as well. I'd like to find an advisor out there who is doing um, halal investing. The, the guest on Jason's podcast was really more concerned about lending and uh, oh, that's super fascinating. Um, and the challenge of course being that as has been the tradition with Christianity, um, that uh, there's no ability to charge interest. Um, Christianity kind of shed that limitation around 1620 or thereabouts. Um, and of course, we still have restrictions around usury, which is charging excessively high interest. But really, historically, for most of Christianity's um, time, there's been that same restriction, just no ability to charge or earn interest. And uh, that you know, brings some interesting um, complications with it, just the idea of getting a mortgage, for example, there's not really a conventional or traditional mortgage that works out that way. So lots there. And uh, yeah, of course, we have a um, healthy amount of uh, immigration in Canada does comprise sort of observant Muslims. So it's, uh, I think it's something worth thinking about. If it's not something you've run into in your practice, uh, it's a question I would expect you're going to get at some point. Okay, the um, number for today's episode is six. The number for today's episode is six. And I hope you'll join us again in uh, two weeks time when I have actually a follow on from our first episode this season. So the first episode this season was with uh, Trevor Lang, or sorry, Trevor Perry. Uh, and uh, Trevor, of course, talked about IPPs and RCAs. And uh, we're going to have actually Fraser Lang on an upcoming episode on the next episode here. And Fraser and I dig into some of the um, maybe more uh, direct for advisor concerns around IPPs and RCA is a really great compliment to Trevor's interview. So yeah, thanks so much for listening and or watching. Enjoy your continued studies. Thanks for watching. Use the link in the description down below to join our CE program. With many of our videos, subscribers can do a short quiz for CE credits and you'll have access to our full library of content.